sir straight away we will move on to our academics over to the moderators dr rajesh and dr vijish please sir okay. good evening everyone uh, we'll uh, go straight to the first talk that is on sepsis and it will be delivered by uh, dr suresh ji nair who is the lead consultant at astromedicity kuchin uh, is a well known speaker and uh, it requires no special introduction so over to you sir for the uh, first talk on sepsis and its guidelines share my slides first you can see my slides yes yes sir yeah just put on the screen okay thank you very much and uh, good evening to all uh, first of all my thanks to the isa uh, leaders for giving me this opportunity to talk about sepsis and septic shock syndromes the guidelines based management as we all know septic shock and sepsis are major health issues all around the world in the late 90s the mortality in the western countries from septic shock was around 40 to 50% and then what we we know that what we had as the first surviving sepsis campaign guidelines which which was published in 2004 now since then the there is some literature which shows that on an average there is a 1% reduction in the mortality over the years and today in the western world the mortality of, of severe sepsis and septic shock stands at 20 to 30 percent subsequently the surviving sepsis campaign guidelines came up in 2008 12 and 2016 after 2016 we had two updates in 2018 and 19 which i'll discuss in brief in the meantime there is also something called the definition of sepsis the first world congress on the definition of sepsis was held in 1991 subsequently in 2001 and the later one Uh, which by which we go today on how to define sepsis and how to diagnose sepsis what i will do in the next uh, 40 minutes or so is first look at the definition and recognition of sepsis and septic shock the major policy changes that has occurred since the last surviving sepsis campaign has been published in 2016 and then i will look into a case which is actually my case on how actually i managed a patient with severe sepsis which is more or less the same as the surviving sepsis campaign and as we go along we'll discuss on what are the things that i deviated from and what is the actual management actually says and then we'll also discuss a few unanswered questions which can be probably have answers in the future now when the surviving sepsis campaign was published in 2016 there was a 3r bundle and the 6r bundle the 3r bundle says that you have to measure the blood lactates you have to send the blood cultures before administration of antibiotics and then when you give antibiotics you have to give one or more antibiotics which is broad, broad spectrum enough to cover the suspected organisms and then fluid resuscitation at 30 ml per kg in patients with severe hypotension or a lactate level of more than 4 millimoles per liter then we had a 6 hour bundle that is in the next 3 hours what should be completed was use vasopressors if in spite of a fluid resuscitation the patients do not respond respond to volume therapy and if the patient still remains unresponsive a repeat focused examination looking at the central venous pressure looking at what is known as the central venous oxygen saturation and also the lactate level in 2018 the the surviving sepsis camp in the group suggested that instead of having a 3 and 6 hour bundle we should combine it together into a 1 hour bundle now this was faced by immediate uh, sort of criticism by the society of critical care medicine which is an american society as well as the american college of emergency physicians which say, who said that it was impractical giving uh, doing all these things together especially delivering antibiotics within one hour because hospital protocols had to be followed however so as a result this update was withdrawn by the end of the year but some sort of compromise occurred between the different groups and therefore in 2019 the one hour bundle was reintroduced so what is the one hour bundle one hour bundle is exactly the same what i mentioned earlier you better measure the blood lactates to make sure that the patient's lactates are more than 2 millimoles per liter immediately obtain blood cultures the importance of obtaining blood cultures i will discuss in the subsequent slide and before before uh, and give antibiotics as soon as the, the blood cultures are taken deliver broad spectrum antibiotics fluid resuscitation at 30 ml per kg for hypotensive patients or those with a lactate of more than 4 millimoles per liter and if they don't respond to fluids you give vasopressors and maintain to maintain a mean arterial pressure of more than 65 mm of mercury 
And if the patients don't respond, we have a re uh, focused approach again, looking at the lactate levels to ensure that the patient is actually improving. Now, as I said earlier, the definition of sepsis was uh, the, the, the World Congress was uh, held in 1991. And the definition of sepsis at that time, based on the available literature, the knowledge at that period of time was based on the response of a host to the infection, which is basically the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. So when you define sepsis at that period of time, it was like changes in the heart rate, tachycardia, the uh, increase in the respiratory rate, hypothermia or hypothermia, uh, as well as uh, WBC counts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Now, they also had a definition of what is known as severe sepsis, which is def defined as infection, which is associated with the organ dysfunction. And then you had septic shock, in which the, the sepsis was associated with shock or hypotension, which is unresponsive to fluids. In 2001, we had a repeat consensus conference, but Although this committee at this period of time knew that there were a lot of lacunae in the definition that was proposed in 1991, they could, did not make any new, new definitions of, uh, of, of sepsis. No, so at this point of time, till 2016, the definition of sepsis was based on the whole or the systemic inflammatory response. And then in 2016, the new uh, Third World Congress on def definition as well as the diagnosis of sepsis was held which defined, sepsis was defined as the life-threatening organ dysfunction caused by a dysregulated host response to infection. Now, if you read this definition very carefully, three things are highlighted. One, the non-homeostatic or the dysregulated host response to infection. Second point is that the lethality of the situation, that is the high risk of mortality and the third thing, the urgency for recognition. The systemic inflammatory response, the parameters of systemic inflammatory response was totally omitted basically because it was a normal response of a body when you have an infection. It does not in any way tell you anything about organ dysfunction. And they also made a definition for the layman in which they say sepsis is a life-threatening condition that happens when the body's response to an infection injures its own organs and tissues. Now, the def how do you recognize sepsis? We, earlier we said we looked at the systemic inflammatory response syndrome. The new def according to a new definition, sepsis is considered, is, is considered when there is a two-point increase in the SOFA scores. I'm not going to details of SOFA scores. It involves five organs. Each organ has got five points. And based on this, a two-point increase in SOFA is generally considered as a diagnosis of sepsis. They also made what is known as a quick SOFA, that is for people who are in the wards or out of hospital, which includes only three parameters, one, an altered mentation or a GCS of less than 13, a systolic pressure of less than 100, or a respiratory rate of more than 22 per minute. And if you fulfill two of these other three criteria, you have to suspect sepsis in the patient transferring to a higher facility. Now, the organ dysfunction, when you say a two-point increase in the organ dysfunction is not a, it's not a small thing because we know today that a two-point increase in the SOFA scores is usually associated with a 10% increase in mortality. Remember that this is much more than the mortality that is associated with uh, ST segment elevation myocardial infarction, which is about only about 8.1%. So a two-point increase in the, in the SOFA scores is generally considered as the diagnosis of sepsis. Now, septic shock is defined as a subset of sepsis in which the underlying circulatory, cellular or metabolic abnormality is profound enough to increase the mortality significantly. Now, today, the definition of septic shock is based on hypotension, which is not responsive to fluid therapy and need to maintain amino, uh, fluid therapy and need vasopressors to maintain a mean arterial pressure of more than 65 millimeters of mercury and a lactate level of more than two millimoles per liter. Now, let me take a case that was in my ICU. This is a 49-year-old gentleman who was a long-term diabetic, had undergone uh, uh, left uh, partial hepatectomy about eight days back. It was a totally uneventful course. During the surgery, we put in a center line, we put in an arterial line, Foley's catheter was placed, a low thoracic epidural was also placed in these patients. Everything went off smoothly. The patient in the ICU was 
uh, started on uh, clear fluids on the second post operative day we shifted him out of the ic on the third post operative day the artery line and the foley catheter were removed the at the request of the surgeon we retained the central venous line up to day 5 and the epidural was removed on the fourth post fourth post operative day on eight day 8 after surgery we got an rrt call or the rapid response team was called and when they attended the patient we found that the patient was having a respiratory rate about 28 per minute definitely breathless he was having a systolic pressure of 80 mm of mercury the pulse rate was 140 per, uh, per minute and the, uh, and there was mild abdominal distension although the peripheries were warm he definitely looked septic so we immediately shifted him to the theater now what do i do when this patient comes to the icu i'll first i will tell you what we did and then we'll come back to the surviving sepsis campaign on the first 15 minutes what i do is i as soon as the patient comes about two nurses come in and uh, maybe a couple of anesthesiologists or the intensivist join us and we give oxygen first now our practice is to put a non invasive ventilation if there's no contraindication for that the reason being a few one it gives the combination of giving oxygen plus non invasive ventilation significantly reduce oxygen consumption or the oxygen uh, load of the respiratory muscles remember that when a patient is in severe distress respiratory distress the oxygen consumption by the respiratory muscles may be as much as 30% of the total oxygen consumption of the body so you are reducing that oxygen consumption and increase oxygen availability in the tissues it also gives us time to observe the patient whether he really needs immediate intubation or not and thirdly it gives us time it buys us time for the nurses to prepare the drugs for intubating the patient however the most important thing the somebody fixes up the pulse oximeter and a non invasive blood pressure is also uh, attached venous access probably one of the most important things that is required now once the venous access is obtained if it's got a good vein good in put in a large cannula and push in fluids now here a caveat is if the patient is not very sick i and if the skin is prepared properly i might take a sample of blood for blood culture and also for biochemistry if it is possible but the priority at this point of time is to give fluids to this patient so what i did for this patient was i put a full flu uh, peripheral line and started infusion of fluids now once this is settled then i start looking at things now a second peripheral line was taken to send the blood for the basic biochemistry including crp as well as pro calcitonin levels now uh, uh, during when i put the second line i also make sure that one sample from the periphery is given for blood cultures and uh, placing an artery line yes it is a priority but a word of caution please remember when these patients who are sick comes into the icu they will have very thready pulse trying to put an artery line may not be possible for the junior level staff and what i would suggest in these patients is give about 500 to 1000 ml of fluids your pulse will become better and then you can put in an artery line don't try to push an artery line when you are not very confident now if after giving 500 ml i find that there is no increase in the blood pressure i will simultaneously start a, a vasopressor like noradrenaline there is no priority for placing a central venous line at this point of time now if what i do is that i look at the patient if the patient needs intubation i'll intubate him first however if the patient is settling down there is no need for immediate intubation then i will pass a central line now once i pass a central line and once i pass I also remember that once i pass an arterial line the first sample of blood that is drawn from that is sent for blood culture that means in the first 30 to 45 minutes i can have a second blood culture sample sent sent and then i give the broad spectrum antibiotics we will discuss the, how to give the antibiotics later and simultaneously i also have an ultrasound machine in the uh, in the icu i will scan the abdomen and the chest to find any potential source of infection during this time you can also do one thing if there's an obvious indwelling catheter for example a uh, urine catheter or a, or a, another central venous line which has been there for some time send a, a sample of culture from that also now let us see what are the guidelines say the first thing is fluid challenge fluid challenge is given at 30 ml per kg how does the 30 ml per kg comes it's based on average of many studies that has actually been done some of these patients may require much more than 30 ml per kg but some patients may require much less for example a patient who is not having a good heart may not tolerate 30 ml per kg so don't get it fixed in your in your mind that you have to give 30 ml per kg you have to see the response to fluid therapy and based on that you have to give your fluids 
the surviving sepsis campaign does not differentiate between saline versus ring lactate versus balanced salt solution what i do in my icu is either give ring lactate or plasma light remember that the next question that is going to come does ring lactate increase the blood lactate levels no it does not as long as your heart, liver is functioning properly ring lactate hardly increase the lactate levels in the blood now if after giving 500 to 1000 ml of fluids i find no change or minimal improvement in the in the uh, blood pressures i simultaneously start a vasopressor through a peripheral line if a central line is not available the choice as you know is not in that uh, that uh, that is freely available no uh, the, the other question is uh, question of colloids i have never ending question is there any advantage of giving colloids over crystalloids they so far they have not had major uh, studies which point that colloids are superior to uh, crystalloids although uh, sub hoc analysis or called post hoc analysis actually showed that in severe septic shock maybe colloids like albumin may have an advantage in my own practice what i do is if i pass give about 1.5 to 2 liters of fluid and the patient still needs fluids what i add is i add 20% albumin to a little of crystalloids and give it to make it a 4% or a 5% solution but what i do know and I, what i don't do is do not give starch or gelatin to these patients at, as it can actually end up in more problem now how do we evaluate the fluid challenge uh, flu, uh, fluid response now many of the intensivists today do not bother about transducing the central venous line central venous line is almost universally required and we all put because it is a source uh, the source through which the inotropes and vasopressors can be given it is a, a sampling port can be used from there but many of the more, almost every intensives that i know do not use a central venous line i would not personally i would not uh, i agree to that because a low central venous pressure like 3 to 4 mm of mercury or a low sent pulmonary capillary vet pressure are definitely indicators that the patient is hypovolemic and they can be given enough more and more fluids for these patients the central line is also important for central venous oxygen saturation remember that the 2016 guidelines says that scvo2 is not a prerequisite or a major indicator of the resistance of the patient now i would differ from that and put it this way the central venous oxygen saturation if it is low in a patient with sepsis and a good heart or a normal heart is a very useful indicator to tell you the progress that you are making if your saturation was 50% and it goes up to 65% it means your resuscitative efforts are good or a fluid responsiveness is good unfortunately a segment of patients with good heart can have a central venous oxygen saturation which is somewhere we are 65 to 70% the two caveats that i want to add at this point is one in patients with cardiac failure do not look at the central venous oxygen saturation these patients because of their poor cardiac output normally has a got have got a low central venous oxygen saturation and if you try to push that scvo2 to about 70% you land up in problem the second thing is from my own experience i find that i have not seen a single person with an scvo2 above 88% survive what it actually means is that when you have a very high central venous oxygen saturation it means that the tissues are already dead or it is completely bypassing the tissues and coming back to the heart and that is not a good indicator of survival we do not use pulmonary artery catheters i also don't use non invasive cardiac output monitors in most of my septic patient not because i don't like it or not because it is not useful but because of the cost that is involved so what are the indices that helps out in fluid responsiveness ivc collapsibility easily identified from a pulse ox uh, from a echocardiogram <coughs> echo machine pulse pressure variability stroke volume variability stroke volume index the tidal volume occlusion test which our uh, next piece of uh, speaker herself is uh, advocating and the passive leg raising test all these are very beautiful or useful indicators of fluid responsiveness now if you look if if you use a non invasive cardiac cardiac output you fill the patient up to the shoulder of the frank starling curve is the best indicator that the patient is adequately filled unfortunately many of these indices uh, it is ni uh, non invasive cardiac output is very expensive and some of these parameters which i mentioned like stroke volume variability the stroke volume index or the passive leg raising test really need a non invasive cardiac output for a useful information 
What we use in ICU is to look at an echocardiogram, very beautiful uh, equipment because it, you can look directly at the heart, see whether this patient is adequately filled or not, regional wall motion anomalies, cardiac function, the uh, adequacy of filling, IVC collapsibility index, anything you want, you can directly measure from that. So in our ICU, we use a combination of pulse pressure variability, which is again, a very, very useful indicator. It's available to almost every monitor that you have today in ICUs. These two are the best monitors that I use routinely. Vasopressor therapy, noradrenaline, a very good, the first drug of choice for vasopressor therapy. Remember that a few unknown facts about norepinephrine is that when you use, there is something, when you fill a patient, what you have to understand is that it fills, the, the fluid that you give actually fills up the veins and it becomes larger and larger. This is known as the unstressed volume. It does not translate into more blood going into the, into the heart. When you use norepinephrine, especially when you use in small concentrations, it increases the venous tone and converts this unstressed IVC volume into a stressed IVC volume, which means it constricts and therefore more fluid from the periphery is actually going to the heart, thereby it increases the stroke volume as well as the cardiac output. The major drawback with norepinephrine, especially in the kidney, is that it constricts both afferent and efferent arterioles and renal blood flow can come down. It is a vasoconstrictor on the coronary circulation and as well as the pulmonary circulation. Now there lies the advantage of vasopressin. Now vasopressin is a drug which produces efferent arterial, arteriolar constriction, which means that the GFR actually increases in the kidney, the urine output actually increases. It is also a coronary dilator as well as a pulmonary dilator. So vasopressin is the second drug of choice that you can use uh, 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 when, you, uh, when you find that there is no response from norepinephrine. Adrenaline, a very good inotrope as well as a vasoconstrictor, Major disadvantage that we know today is that it produces what is known as an uh, accelerated uh, aerobic uh, uh, glycolysis, which can produce hyperlactemia. So as a result, when you look at the lactates to see whether you're progressing or not, it may not be reliable. Do not use dopamine. It's one of the last drugs to be used because most of the studies which has compared all these vasopressors have shown that mortality in dopamine group is much higher because of the arrhythmias it can produce. Phenylephrine, we don't consider too much. And you should also know, be, uh, we should also know when do you use a drug like dobutamine or levosimendin. Now, if you have a patient, you have fluid resuscitated the patient, you have started vasopressors, and you find that the patient's mean arterial pressure is more than 70, 60, uh, 75 millimeters of mercury, but the patient continues to have a low, uh, 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 sorry, uh, a high lactate level or a high uh, arterial venous carbon dioxide difference, then it means that the microcirculation is inadequate. This is the time then we can use dobutamine or levosimidin. So it increases the microcirculation. Now, there are a lot of studies which actually compare levosimidin, which is supposed to be a very good microcirculatory drug, but there is no evidence as such to prove that levosimidin should be used instead of dobutamine. The target mean arterial pressure is, of course, 65 millimeters of mercury. Numerous studies, again, combat higher values with, low, with 65 millimeters. No major advantages has been seen, although in a subset of patients with kidney disease or elderly patients, the incidence of renal failure may, may, be a little less, uh, may be a little less, but also produce more arrhythmias. Now, what we do, as I said, as soon as you put an arterial line, you take a sample. After two hours, we take a simultaneous arterial and central venous sample and look at the uh, two things. One is the central venous oxygen saturation, whether it is improved with your fluid resuscitation. And second is we looked at the arterial venous carbon dioxide difference. Any value more than eight, it considers, it can be considered as inadequate tissue perfusion. We have already sent, say, the third important thing during this period of time is identify the source. We have already sent the basic in biochemical investigations. Blood cultures have been sent, two or more blood cultures have been sent additional sample from any wound discharge or, on, uh, or any possible source of infection. And as I said, we also do an abdominal scan or a chest scan to find out whether there is any collection. In fact, in our patient, what we did was we scanned the abdomen and we could find a perihepatic collection. And we called the radiologist for more specific identification for this patient. Now, a CT would be the ideal choice to identify the source of infection, but it may not be possible when the patient is unstable. 
However, what is important to understand is that source control should happen within six to 12 hours. Now, sometimes the source cannot be controlled. For example, an infected pancreatic tissue you can't do anything about it or a cerebral abscess, which may not be possible to remove immediately. But then like an abdominal abscess or a chest uh, empyema can easily be removed. And what is important to remember here again is that the evacuation of the source of infection should be done with the least physiological insult to the patient. Antibiotic therapy, what we suggest is broad spectrum antibiotic therapy that will cover the entire spectrum of organisms which you suspect. Now, there is a, a, a term difference. You can use a multi-drug regime in which you cover gram-positive and gram-negative organisms. For example, you give a meropenem and a, and a T-complanin if, if you're not sure what is the possible source of infection. You also have what is known as a combination therapy. Combination therapy is a term that is used when two antibiotics from different classes are used against the same organism. For example, in neutropenic patients, sepsis, or in patients who are severely immunocompromised and you know the organism, you can give a combination therapy basically to get rid of the organism as early as possible. Now, why do we take the blood culture as early as possible? The reason is that even a single dose of antibiotic can cause the organism to disappear from the blood and you will not know what you're dealing with. That's why we want the, so the blood cultures to be sent before giving the first dose of antibiotic. And there are enough studies that show that, uh, that the longer you wait for before we give the first dose of antibiotic, the higher is the mortality. Antifungal therapy is not used empirically, but if you suspect in a patient, for example, long-staying patient in the hospital who develops sepsis or an immunocompromised patient, you can use antifungal therapy. And remember that you start two or three antibiotics, but de-escalation once you identify the organism is very, very important. It's part of antibiotic stewardship. Our practice, we, I can start any antibiotic I want in our own hospital. Nobody will question me. But after giving the third or the fourth dose, I have to talk to my ID specialist, justify what I'm doing, and only with their permission, I can go ahead with the third dose. In fact, there are some hospitals which actually mean that after the third dose, if you do not discuss the case or have not got permission from the ID department, the next dose of antibiotic will not be issued by the hospital pharmacy. Again, a few other things about antibiotic therapy. Do, if a patient is having a mild LV, uh, uh, renal dysfunction or not, the first dose of antibiotic should be the maximum loading dose. And I, because the reason is that these patients are pushed in lots of fluids. Most of the patients who are in sepsis will have a lot of urine open on the first day. That means the volume of distribution is very high. And when you give an antibiotic, you need a certain minimum level of inhibitory level of antibiotic in the tissues. Uh, in the tissues. And for that, you have to give the maximum dose. So what we do in our practice is that we give maximum dose of uh, um, uh, uh, antibiotic. And the first day, we do not restrict the antibiotic uh, uh, dose. Suppose it is meropenem, we give one gram six thousand on the first day. Second day, we adjust it according to renal requirements. Secondly, all anesthetists should know how to give antibiotics. For example, if you give cephalosporins, if you give the loading dose of antibiotic can be given, say, in half an hour. But after that, the cephalosporins act only when the minimum concentration of the drug is available in the blood. Uh, in, in the blood, And for that, you will have to give it as a continuous infusion. On the other hand, if you have drugs like uh, aminoglycoside or quinolones, they should be given in very high, con full dose of the drug is given as a single dose, and that produces a maximum effect for these patients. Steroids should not have much of a role. If a patient does not respond to your vasopressors and fluid therapy, then steroids may be added in a low dose of 200 milligrams of hydrocortisone. We usually give it as an infusion over 24 hours. And the major advantage of shock is uh, of hydrocortisone in septic shock is that the shock resolves faster. And once the shock resolves, you should automatically stop or taper off the, uh, of the, of the uh, corticosteroids. Transmission protocols. Now, the famous reverse study, which was published in 2001, used SCV02 as a primary target of uh, resuscitation of this patient, but they also maintained a hemoglobin of 10 grams per cent. Now, after that, three or four major studies, for example, the ARISE trial, the protocol trial, or the process uh, study, all these are huge studies of 1,500 to 3,000 patients. 
they did not keep 10 grams uh, hemoglobin as a cutoff value they used much lower values and today we can uh, the the surviving sepsis campaign says that the cutoff value is less than 7 grams per cent now if the patient is bleeding you can do a rotum or a tech to find out what is this, uh, what are the possible cause and give uh, uh, products according to the requirements but one thing i want to stress here is that even if your rotum or tech is abnormal if the patient is not bleeding do not use blood products unnecessarily in the patient the ventilation is again a huge chapter i'm just going to say a few things one is we use protective lung strategies low tidal volume keep the plateau pressure less than 30 cm of water maintain the respiratory rate so as to have a near normal or slightly hypercapnic patients the peep is totally dependent on the hemodynamic status of the patient if the patient is hemodynamically stable i would like stable i would like to use a higher peep but many of these patients may not tolerate high levels of peep and then you have to force to use a, a lower peep the second thing that influences the level of peep is the extent of lung damage that has already occurred now the surviving sepsis campaign again uh, advocates the use of lung recruitment therapy see the main thing is that when, uh, the, soon after the publication of 2016 guidelines a major study called the art trial art trial was published in which they showed that lung recruitment can actually increase the mortality of these patients if you try doing it so i do not advocate too much of lung recruitment but if it is patient is responding i might use it we do not use nitric oxide there's been a failure so far however what we use is prone ventilation now our confidence in using prone ventilation has uh, multiplied hundreds of times with the onset of the covid uh, protocol most of our patients are on prone ventilation and we use prone ventilation extensively 16 to 18 hours and it has produced major beneficial effects muscle relaxants are usually used in the 24 to 48 hours and uh, once a patient is stable we would try to de escalate or de recruit a de uh, sort of make the patient negative because conservative fluid therapy is always better for the lungs or any tissue we all know that today and when you prone the patient when the patient is supine always use a daily sedation and muscle relaxant break to ensure that the patient is fully normal we maintain the blood sugar levels be less than 180 mg per cent a couple of things i want to stress here is that uh, uh, we use insulin infusion to control the blood sugar intermittent insulin may not be useful in these patients but what is more, what i want to stress about is that do not allow your blood sugars to fluctuate between high to low levels it is more harmful than having a continuous high blood sugar blood sugar levels in these patients the surviving sepsis can, campaign does not differentiate between different types of renal replacement therapy your crrt or uh, uh, continuous renal replacement therapy versus intermittent hemodialysis if your patient is volume loaded hemodynamically unstable crrt would be useful in these patients but it's the cost is very very high and that you have to take into account so what we do in our setup if we use what is known as a slow low efficiency dialysis which is somewhere between a crrt and an intermittent hemodialysis it produces more stable hemodynamics and therefore we use it more extensively dvt preflux of course is mandatory for all our patients as long as the patient is uh, uh, bleeding we use only mechanical preflux or uh, per, uh, peripheral pump uh, techniques but once the patient is stable we use uh, uh, one of the anticoagulants most of our patients are given a head up on uh, uh, all our patients are given a head up we use either ppi or h2 antagonist there is no major difference so far that has been appreciated now do not unnecessarily use these agents once you start feeding the patient they have taken a normal diet these things can actually be stopped because the incidence of ventilator associated pneumonia is much less than that we very vigorously follow what is known as the selective oral decontamination technique with chlorhexidine every 4 to 6 hours for all our ventilated and non ventilated patient when we intubate these patients we use a suction aided endotracheal tube and a closed suction is always used in, uh, in these patients early enteral nutrition is what we do as early as possible you remember that it is not necessary that you have to fully feed them all their calorie requirements is, is to be uh, fulfilled you just need to keep, keep the gut moving and for that what even trophy feeds is enough panel nutrition we do not advocate for the first 7 days most of the studies till date has shown that starting panel nutrition within the first 7 days actually results in an increased mortality we also do not use any immune modulating diet at any point of time what is more again important or uh, sort of important is 
we have regular multidisciplinary team meetings. Now, what is multidisciplinary team meetings? We first have a meeting where all the consultants who are concerned with the patient, maybe a uh, intensivist, the parent department who brings in the patient, the, the uh, clinic, uh, the physician, the, inter, uh, the nephrologist, we all sit together, including the respiratory therapist, we sit together and plan what is required for these patients. And then we call the latest insight every three or four days, discuss with them what is actually, actually happening to the patient, the pros and cons of each of these treatment modalities. And if the patient is not doing well, we always tell them, especially when it is futile, we tell them that it is not, uh, please understand that it is a futile attempt and we might as well give up, but the final decision is left to the relatives. Now, before I close my talk, a few unanswered questions on first thing with the fluid resuscitation. Now, I said 30 ml per kg is the fluid resuscitation that we used. How did it come about? Now, unfortunately, most of the major studies which actually looked at different uh, the fluid, res uh, fluid resuscitation did not actually pay too much attention to the amount of fluids that has been given. And this three, 30 ml per kg is based on some of the major studies that has been published, which the volume actually given to these patients varied from 1.5 to 4.5 liters. And they came to a conclusion 30 ml per kg is actually uh, given. Now, second question is, should volume therapy be individualized? Now, we said 30 ml per kg to be given the first one hour bundle. Now, there are studies which actually show that if you push fluids, there's an African study which shows that if you actually push fluids into a patient fast, it can actually increase the mortality. We do not know how fast we can give the uh, give uh, fluids to these patients. What is the optimal timing for fluid, uh, fluid therapy? In fact, again, studies have actually shown that if you go to pick up a patient from home and you start fluid resuscitation at that point of time, it may actually improve the outcome. What is the best index of fluid responsiveness? Again, we don't know. Uh, what is the one we follow PPV? Should we follow a single parameter or follow a set of parameters which may be more confusing? And when do you actually start de-resuscitation or making the patient uh, uh, patient negative. Now, how long do you wait once the patient is stable? You know the chart about uh, resuscitation, optimizing maintenance, and then de resuscitation. So, when do we actually start resuscitating these patients? It's an unanswered question. When should vasopressor be therapy, uh, started? Now, there is no answer. Surviving sepsis amenin has not given us a definite time when, after fluid resuscitation, we should actually start vasopressor th therapy. And is there like 30 ml per kg? Is there a target for? cardiac failure patient. These are unanswered. Second, on the type of fluids, is there adequate evidence to suggest that balanced salt solution is superior to saline? Maybe a lot of retrospective studies which showed that saline can definitely increase mortality, definitely increase the incidence of renal failure, or et cetera, et cetera. What about prospective studies? The split study which was published a few, few years earlier, which compared saline with uh, balanced salt solution did not show any difference. On the other hand, there's something called the SMART study, a huge study of 16,000 patients, which actually showed that if you use balanced salt solution, definitely decrease the incidence of renal failure, the requirements for renal replacement therapy, as well as the mortality. But there is no definite guidance on this. Surviving sepsis has not given an answer. Now, we say we use balanced salt solution. Many of these contain solutions contain gluconate, gluconate or acetate. There are studies which show that too much of gluconate can actually produce a vasoparalytic state and myocardial depression. Does the type of fluid Im important only when large volumes are considered? Now, this is a sub hoc or a post hoc analysis of the stat studies which show that th these things are important, that saline versus crystalloids are important only when you give large volumes of fluid, not when small things are given. Second important thing is why is saline so dangerous? Is it the chloride or the uh, hyperchloremia which is dangerous? or the change in pH, which is important. And should albumin be used as volume therapy or not? We still don't have an answer. And what is the optimal concentration of albumin? Because somewhere I've read that 5% albumin is superior to 20% to albumin. And finally, vasopressor therapy, when and what should be the starting dose of norepinephrine? Unlike in cardiac surgery, we use very small dose like 0 0.025 or 0 0.05. In sepsis, you go up to 0.5 microgram. And if you're going higher up on the norepinephrine, when and what should be the second line of therapy? When should we start vasopressin or adrenaline? Now, is there a difference between vasopressin and uh, uh, adrenaline in the outcome? We don't still do not know. Mean arterial pressure of 65 millimeters are still not, uh, um, we still do not know whether it's the ideal temperature, uh, uh, pressure, especially for hypertensive patient. 
And how could should vasopressors be weaned? Which should you wean first? These are unanswered questions. The role of levosimenin is still unanswered. So to summarize my talk, I would say that what happened to our patient, we, as, as I said, we put a venous line, pushed in fluids, we put an arterial line, we took blood samples from peripheral line as well as arterial line. He did not have a indwelling catheter. We also did the abdominal scan quickly, found out there was some fluid, called a radiologist. He confirmed that the fluid was required. The antibiotics were administered by 30, 75 minutes in the IC once he came back. And then the surgeon suggested that surgeon said that we cannot tap it percutaneously, so we want to take the patient up for surgery. So we took him up for surgery, drained some pus from the abdomen. We covered before that. Once the cultures were taken, we covered them with broad spectrum antibiotic. We used two uh, gram negative and a gram positive culture. By the time the cultures came, we could taper off uh, the uh, gram positive organism uh, of uh, gram positive uh, uh, antibiotic that was used. Patient was ventilated using the protective lung ventilation strategy for three days and then extubated. There was a discharge from the wound side, which again we sent for culture, but we sent him back to the ward. He did not come back to the ICU. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Thank you, sir. Thank you for that comprehensive uh, discussion on uh, sepsis and septic shock. And I think there are a few questions in the chat box, sir. We can. Uh, if you don't mind, we can start discussing one by one. Yeah. The first question is, is empirical antibiotics recommended? Yeah, in a, in a patient with, uh, uh, I, I would also, uh, before I start answering the question, I would also like to invite Dr. Sheila also to answer the question because she's an expert in critical care also. So uh, yeah, empirical antibiotics can, should be started as soon as you know or suspect that the patient is having sepsis. There's nothing wrong in that. But what is more important and what I want to stress again and again is that de-escalation is as important as starting an antibiotic. Once you know the organism, then you have to uh, reduce the, uh, either one day based on the sensitivity, you have to de-escalate the antibiotic. Now, this is a very, very difficult situation because most of the surgeons whom we face as anesthetists are very reluctant to de-escalate the antibiotics. That is a one major problem. The second problem arises, see, even in the Western countries, with all the new technology, maximum identification of organism when you send a blood culture is around 30, 40 to 50%. What happens to the remaining 50%? Do we say, continue the same antibiotic that we have started? How do we de-escalate? If you want to de-escalate, how do we de-escalate? These are questions that cannot be answered easily. I hope I have answered the question. Sheila, you want to put in something more? Uh, yeah, so you've said everything, but I just want to add that, um, again, deciding the antibiotic, again, depends on what kind of infections you have uh, in your community and in your area. That's also very important, and you need to get it right at the first time. So we start with a very broad spectrum antibiotic, as Sir has rightly said. You have a patient in septic shock. You can't take a chance. You've got to get it right the first time. And uh, in this, again, like, for example, things like pneumonias, in the Western world, you have more gram-positive pneumonias, whereas we see more gram-negative. So our local flora is also very important while selecting uh, this kind of antibiotic. And as Sir has rightly said, the de-escalation is the key. When you get the report, continuing with these broad-spectrum antibiotics, meropenem, et cetera, for days really results, propagates antimicrobial resistance. One guidance you can use is you can use the procalcitonin levels. And if the procalcitonin level is less than 0.5, uh, this is not a way to start antibiotics, but it can give you some guidance as to whether you can uh, stop the antibiotics. So, but again, if there's renal dysfunction, the procalcitonin may not be very reliable, but you can definitely use it as a cl clinical guide to have some confidence in addition to your clinical uh, assessment to uh, stop the antibiotic. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am, for that uh, updates. There's another query in the chat box. Is there any role for uh, dextrose in patients in whom enteral nutrition has not started for more than 24 hours in order to prevent protein catabolism? I don't think that there is any role for giving dextrose because uh, the amount of calories that can be given by one gram of glucose is only for four calories. So giving glucose intravenously, I'm not very, I'm, I'm, we don't practice it. Sheila, you're okay. Yeah. Absolutely right. Not necessary. What's important is to start the enteral nutrition at the earliest, even a low volume if you can, 
because the problem in septic shock and what happens is when you don't feed the gut is there's a translocation of the bacteria and this is the thing that results in the uh, you know uh, the pneumonias and the other uh, uh, multi organ failure that you see so the important thing is to keep the gut motility going whenever feasible at the earliest even if you are able to start small volumes like 20 ml you should uh, consider starting it at the earliest so i would not worry so much about the calories as i would worry about the maintaining the uh, gut uh, uh, function and the mucosal integrity yes the 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 question is here is not the calories that you receive it's the it's the motility or the functionality of the yes. gut which is more important yes sir so the next query is on your 30 ml per kilogram crystalloid resuscitation yes so uh, would you use that in a patient with ckd or in a patient with low ef i think that's already... exactly what i was trying to tell you that 30 ml per kg uh, that is uh, suggested by the surviving sepsis campaign is for a normal person with a with a normal heart and a low systemic vascular resistance you cannot use it in a patient with with cardiac failure or a patient who they definitely go into pulmonary edema or a patient with ckd so that is the, that is the point when you have to use other other aspects such as your ppv which is easily available you don't have to go anywhere ppv is available on every monitor you just have to set it up and you can use it anywhere you don't need a non vesic cardiac output nothing you can second thing is if you have an ultrasound or echo machine you can use it in an icu do not use do not please don't uh, understand that 30 ml per kg is just a guidance which we have to some people may require more and some people may require definitely less than that so you have to use your clinical experience and the available uh, equipment with you to identify what is what is the right volume of responsiveness so if i may just add i think you've made a very very important point because a lot of people who just follow these protocols blindly straight away understand that first you give 30 mls of uh, fluid to this patient uh, but you really need to i would say uh, this is a vasodilatory shock uh, shock definitely distributive shock and you will need uh, larger volumes of fluid and a lot of patients have poor outcomes because they're not adequately fluid resuscitated nevertheless i would say i would give 10 ml uh, per kg initially but the assessment is very important what is the response after that is very important just blanket giving 30 ml like and this has been challenged this guideline has been challenged by several europeans the ssc guidelines about the fluid management and they think that it is uh, too dangerous to just give 30 ml like sir said if there's cardiac failure there's renal dysfunction so maybe 9 out of 10 patients will need it but some won't and you'll cause harm so i would say give 10 ml assess if required give 10 ml more so keep the assessment going between 10 to 10 ml uh, so that you don't give land up giving uh, fluid to a patient who is not a fluid responder what madam is telling is you give 500 see the response and another 250 to feel you can go like that yeah so the next question is on the dose of albumin that you use in your icu yeah weight 5% or 20% how much Uh, ml per ki kilogram of body weight would you advise yeah. albumin is a big i mean i really don't know all our surgeons use it right and left i really don't know whether it makes any difference the only place where i find albumin is useful is in a patient who's got renal failure where we just to stimulate an output i have used albumin with elastics it is useful that's only my personal experience but we still continue using an expensive Uh, equ- i mean uh, expensive drug i would call it a drug for no reason at all there is there is some evidence that shows that in severe septic shock using albumin may be useful but this very like for example the safe study in a post hoc analysis showed that if you use albumin in in in, in patients with severe septic shock there may be a beneficial effect then there's an something called the albio study the albio study looked at 90 day mortality and they found that if you keep your Albumin level about three grams per cent. Remember that when you give fluids, crystalloid, the albumin level is going to come down. So if you can keep the albumin level above three grams per cent in the first twenty-eight days or seven days, I'm not very sure. Then the ninety-day mortality in septic shock may be a little less. But there is no other evidence to suggest that albumin is is, is useful. Uh, you, if you, uh, Sheila, you can. I mean, yes. can answer. Absolutely you. right. Absolutely right. There is no evidence, and it's expensive. and it has a short life you cannot just use it for volume expansion but uh, in some cases yes we do use it we give 20 uh, 20% bd we would give for about 3 days in and where would use it in resuscitation is we use about 4% uh, 
uh, we take 100 ml of uh, saline out of the bottle and add uh, 100 ml of 20% albumin and that way it becomes 4%. And this is uh, the only situation where I use it for resuscitation. Very rarely, again, we have to be very conscious, of course, uh, in this uh, setting. But when we find a patient who has very leaky committees, just not maintaining the intravascular volume, and is losing, um, you know, just you give fluid, the blood pressure comes up, again, the blood pressure falls and is very, very, um, you know, volume responsive, but at the same time has, uh, you know, is not, uh, it's third spacing a lot. This kind of patient is the one sometimes I resuscitate with 4% albumin. Others, by and large, there's no evidence to use it for resuscitation or even routinely in patients with septic shock. I, I can add one more point to that uh, question which was raised. Now, once a patient is resuscitated, he's fully volume loaded, his lungs are congested. And patient is hemodynamically stable. On the next, in those situations, I start using 20% albumin along with laxix to enhance the de resuscitation of the patient, get the fluid out of it. Yeah. That has been shown to be useful. And many of these patients who have severely volume load have got albumin levels somewhere between 1.5 to 2. In these patients, giving concentrated albumin maybe once or twice a day has helped me to de resuscitate the patient or get the patient more and more negative. Otherwise, mm -hmm. during resuscitation, like Sheila said, no, I I start using it as I said. After 1.5 liters, I still find the patient requires. I like she said, one liter of fluid. I take out 100 ml and add 20 percent albumin, make it four percent solution, and then I use it uh, as a as a fluid for resuscitation. That's the only thing. So the next query is regarding the use of inotropes. Uh, whether is there any preference of dobutamine or levosimendan? and Again, my, in my talk, I have clearly said what are the indications for using levosimilan. You have a patient who is fluid resuscitated. You have a uh, 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 you have got a good pressure with using vasopressors, but your SCVO2 is, uh, is rather high. I would say rather high and your lactate levels are high. In these patients, what I understand is, I remember, I put it this way. Now, on one side, you are giving pushing the heart to give more and more, deliver more oxygen to the tissues. You are, at the other side, the venous side, we are checking what is actually being measured as the venous oxygen saturation, what comes back. Now, with the venous saturation is high, and I'm giving enough oxygen, it means that the tissues are not picking up adequate oxygen. That means there is a microcirculatory failure. So I have to increase the microcirculation. In these situations, I would use dobutamine or levosimendan. Again, remember, there are lots of studies on levosimendan, but there is no uh, guidelines which is supporting the use. Major studies have not shown major uh, any difference. And I also doubt whether there's any literature which actually supports the use of dobutamine. Dobutamine was specifically used in the reverse study in 2001 under the present circumstances or conditions which I have mentioned earlier. So what would be the dose of adrenaline in septic shock? Adrenaline See, finally, uh, uh, I'll tell you, I'll be very frank. If if my norelin dose is more than 0.2, if my vasopressin dose is uh, more than 2.5 units per hour, and if I use more than 0.2 or 0.3 adrenaline, I don't think I have hardly any patients. Maybe less than 10% of the patients are going to survive. I have not seen uh, any patients survive with that. Those patients who survive have survived with lower doses of all these drugs. But the dose, remember that the dose that is advocated for sepsis for noradrenaline is up to 0.5 microgram per kg per minute. I think with adrenaline also, you can use higher dose like 0.2 or 0.3. But remember that it just produces apoptosis and destroys the heart. That's my understanding of it. Uh, Sheila, you want to add anything? Yeah, I might just add, actually, the drug that is recommended is norepinephrine, especially during resuscitation, we prefer not to use adrenaline. And the reason for this is because adrenaline can cause accelerated glycolysis, and this can in increase the lactate levels uh, falsely. You know, so we, a lot of our resuscitation, we target based on the lactates. So if the lactates are, uh, you know, the lact time very quickly, the lactates are high, we have to clear it and get reduce the time to clearing the lactates. So this can be erroneously high and we can uh, look at that as, you know, deranged tissue perfusion. And so uh, it can be very tricky. So even if adrenaline is used initially by someone, we switch over quickly to norepinephrine because that is a recommended uh, drug with maximum evidence. And again, coming back to dobutamine, again, if there's cardiac dysfunction, as a lot of patients have sepsis-induced myocardial dysfunction, we give a lot of fluid, but it's very, very important, like Sir said, to do an echo. A lot of time you see global hypokinesia and you see a low ejection fraction in these patients. 
and uh, these are the patients in whom we would uh, start uh, uh, dobutamine. Otherwise, just starting um, you know, inotrope is really not indicated in septic shock. And uh, about levosimendin, just one uh, um, this thing. Levosimendin has a very long half life. It's more used in chronic heart failure because you know in in ICU you need drugs which you have very good titrate. You can titrate very. Uh, you know, with a low uh, die half life. So that, in that sense, um, uh, you know, I don't prefer to use levetimendin. And as Sir has rightly said, there's not good evidence for us to switch over to using uh, levetimendin because the drug has a uh, very good, uh, you know, promising kind of effects. Cardiac analysis allows that. Yeah. That's yeah. Why. <laughs> uh, the next two questions are based on this COVID scenario, sir. <clears throat> in uh, COVID with septic shock, what would be your fluid recommendations? COVID, uh, COVID with septic shock, again, the basic basic uh, recommendations remain the same. But please remember that these patients have already got a destroyed lung. There's already got ground glass, uh, uh, ground glassing of their lungs. That means their extracellular water is already high. So that you have to be on guard on how much fluids that you you want to use in the in these in these patients. Now, the second thing is, is uh, uh, I'm not very sure whether a PPP would be useful in these patients. What would actually be useful if you, uh, theoretically speaking, in these patients is that uh, uh, extravascular lung water, if you can find out, that is the best indicator because many of these patients have got capillary leak syndrome. So PPI along with extra, PPI and the pulmonary vascular permeability index along with extravascular uh, uh, lung uh, extravascular lung water index is the best way to identify how much fluids to be used in patients with COVID. We don't use it routinely. So in the absence of this, I would be extremely careful about how much to use and I would be on guard regarding the use of PPV also because PPV will tell, tells you what is the intravascular volume but when you have a capillary leak ongoing same time, I'm not very sure. I would like Sheila to uh, yeah. Uh, thank you, sir. So very rightly said, sir. Um, I, again, the good thing about COVID is by and large, it's overwhelmingly a respiratory kind of disease. We're not seeing so much of, um, you know, a typical septic shock type of hypotension or anything like that. We see a lot of respiratory failure and ARDS. But if at all we do, like sir rightly said, you manage exactly the same. The one thing that is different is the patient has bad lungs. So you have to be very cautious about giving fluid and here assessing fluid responsiveness becomes more important. And as I said in my uh, previous talk, even if a patient is fluid responsive, if I see the risk of giving fluid is more, then I might avoid giving fluid and give vasopressors. And to assess this, you will need a bit of advanced hemodynamic monitoring. Like Sir has rightly said, use your um, PICO or uh, EV1000, and you must look at the extravascular lung water index. You must look at the pulmonary vascular permeability index. And if the extravascular lung water index is higher, then normal is between 7 to 10. But if it's going up, then even if patient is fluid responsive, we should start vasopressors. So this is one area in COVID and shock is a very complex and difficult uh, to treat. And we should do advanced hemodynamic monitoring in this setting. Thank you, ma'am. What is your take on uh, antifungal, sir? during this uh, COVID scenario, especially during uh, usage of uh, steroids? Yes, antifungals, we, uh, the indications of starting empiric uh, antifungals in patients with COVID, long stay, more than 10 days, high dose, especially indiscriminate use of steroids, those patients, they're going to septic shock, I would start one of the antifungals. So what, what we usually do is Casper fungin or something we start in our, in our setup. Uh, only in those specific patients. Otherwise, routinely not, again, not on the first day. I would always consult my ID specialist, then only I would start antifungal. I may start on the first day sometimes, but uh, I would seek the help of uh, 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 ID specialist immediately. Sheila, you have any Absolutely. No, no role for prophylactic use of antifungals. People are so worried about muca that they're just starting antifungals left, right, and center. I think this practice should be stopped. And unless we have, um, you know, patients on broad spectrum antibiotics and not responding and then having hypotension, we should look for other nosocomial infection. Maybe it's a catheter related or some other problems. And then, like Sir rightly said, you can, you know, think of candidemia perhaps or some other infection and then 
consider starting an antifungal. Mm -hmm. But again, I would not start things like amphotericin, liposomal antifotericin, and a lot of things that people are starting uh, empirically on these patients uh, just because we've used high dose of steroid. So do you use anything specific to promote uh, gut motility in septic patients on ventilator? I don't use, I use, what I said is, uh, as I said, we use uh, selective oral decontamination, most of our patients on ventilator or not. That is, we using chlorhexidine, we uh, give mouthwash every four to six hours. That is done. And uh, recently we have started using uh, polymyxin B for our cardiac surgical patients, routine and we found that that is for selective de uh, decontamination of the digestive like SDD. And that is not a septic patient. Routine, we found that there was a significant reduction in patients who were having VAP. But uh, so far, in our septic patients, we have not started using uh, SDD. I don't know whether Sheila is using it. No, no, not at all. Not at all, sir. And sir, how early do you start enteral feeding in these septic patients? As as soon as my lactates are being tapered, I, I, I don't use it when the uh, norepinephrine dose is 0.3 or something. Once, once my norepinephrine dose is less than 0.1 mics per kg per minute, my adrenaline is coming towards 0 0.05 mics per kg per minute, or my vasopressin dose is also coming towards, let's say, less than 1. And my lactate levels in the blood are approaching towards, uh, towards 5 or less than that. I start giving clear fluids to see how what is the response. Otherwise, I would not. I, I would. I would wait till that these things happen. Uh, I don't know whether this in Bombay what is the practice. Yeah, exactly the same. I mean, at the earliest, we try to start enteral feeding because that is most physiological and best for the patient. Uh, but of course, if patient is on high dose vasopressors, then the splanting circulation is again compromised, and you're worried about. Uh, you know, the gut. Uh, so uh, in that setting, we won't. But even on low dose of vasopressors, like Sir rightly said, we don't wait to stop the vasopressors or the lactate to absolutely normalize. We start uh, the enteral feeding at the earliest. The bottom line is that as early as possible, trophic feeds. Yeah. Thank you, sir. And the last question in the chat box, sir. What, what would you do if the patient doesn't respond to norepinephrine and vasopressin? Then, I, of course, the next choice for me is... Uh, no, I, I would I would think of uh, one is ECMO. I would think of ECMO. I would my I, the, the first before that I would start of start using a small dose of adrenaline, and uh, definitely consult uh, to discuss with the patient regarding uh, the use of ECMO. Mm -hmm. Yes. Anything else, uh, Sheila wants to add? I, uh, I no, sir. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for those uh, answers, for the discussion. And I think there are uh, many senior members in the, uh, in the audience. And if they would like to share their experience or uh, put a few comments, I think they can unmute and do so. I think Vinodhan, sir, is there. Vinil, they can unmute, right? I'll change the settings, yes. They can unmute and ask, sir. Yeah, sir. Uh, we know then, sir. Mubarak, sir. Kameshwar Rao, sir. Uh, I think there are many senior members. We know then, sir, is unmuted. Sir, please, sir. Yes. Hello? Am I audible? Yes, yes. yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. Uh, Suresh, fantastic lecture. I wanted to hear this specifically because I wanted to know what has gone. Yeah, I've heard your lectures earlier, so I wanted to see whether something new has come up. One thing I read recently was about the Andromeda shock trial. Yes. I think you must have yes. So that actually says that instead of all these things, you can use the uh, capillary, capillary time. refill time. And then... Uh, what they suggest is that in a patient with uh, uh, who is hypovolemic uh, and also the lactates are less uh, high, you go ahead and then monitor this, and that gives you better better uh, response, or rather, uh, you know when to stop it, how to go about it. But a lactate, according to that particular trial, is given used only in patients in the initial stage, because according to the, the some of the uh, some of the uh, uh, 
uh, results they have shown actually lactates keep on rising and at that time it's difficult to follow it yes i agree sir but my my doubt in that uh, study andromeda trial was how practical it is to look at the capillary refill time and it's, uh, isn't it very subjective or do you have a device to do you identify that you know i think that is this something that if you keep practicing uh, i think it should be okay but there is there is a problem as you said there is a problem when you have a really bad septic patient and then uh, the extremities, extremities are really cold probably it's of no use but probably in the early phase or when it's, when you are actually feeling with a real septic shock that is the warm shock then i think it is good but again as you said there are uh, i mean people who use 3 seconds as the normal time some people use 2 seconds as the normal time so it's difficult to have a thing but i think it's a method which can be used which we used to use earlier it's forgotten that's why i wanted to bring this up there is lot of talk on andromeda trial but i uh, my uh, my uh, problem was that there is a lot of subjective factors come into picture that's why it's so doubtful about the trial i mean uh, sheila what what is yeah, your yeah if i may add actually uh, vinodan sir you made a very important point people have actually forgotten how to do uh, especially the younger generation the capillary refill time and what andromeda study has actually shown is lactate based resuscitation and capillary time based resuscitation there was really no difference and they have given a very nice video actually along with this as to how to do it using one slide so you know it can we've started practicing this now to the bedside and i think it's a very simple especially in resource limited settings or when you don't have lactate i think we should Uh, you know get, encourage people and get back to uh, doing looking at capillary refill time and this is uh, you know also encourage people to look at touch the patient feel the patient and look at the bedside rather than just looking at the lab so i think this is a very interesting study yes. and now professor glen is doing the second part of it the andromeda 2 study has just gone to start now so it's very interesting <coughs> hello hello ah uh, sir i am dr s g k murthy i wish to ask one question the uh, if the patient is going for uh, dic and what uh, anticoagulants and what dose will you suggest sir the uh, i will not use anticoagulants what my practice is to use the uh, rotum or uh, tg the thromboelastogram to identify what is the what is the actual uh, coagulation abnormality and correct that uh, i don't think there is a role for anti coagulation in this in these patients um, maybe i am ignorant uh, sheila no no i agree with you sir i agree we would use teg sir so we go by the rotum or the teg find out what is the deficiency and then correct it accordingly so If there are no more questions, I think uh, we will thank sir and ma'am for. Uh, Kuchal Babu, sir, is there any comment on Kuchal Babu? Yeah, 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 very good talk, boy. The Dr. Suresh has given uh, all the points are covered, but only thing is uh, adrenaline. Uh, why we don't use it? Only twice of after the patient is not <clears throat> respond with no adrenaline, and vice versa, we will start the hydrocortisone. But adrenaline is very, very rarely used unless uh, adrenaline is uh, not at all. We will use. there is only one comment i want to make it except everything is everything covered the, all the questions answered very well i think enlightened all the audience is i hope you enrich with all the doctors so i think that uh, there's not only i didn't uh, i don't accept it but as a third choice yes sir but i don't i don't use it adrenaline not i think that's the point that uh, dr sheela was also telling yeah. that because once you add adrenaline it becomes more yeah. complicated Yeah. but the surviving sepsis campaign has not at least so far not differentiated between the second line drugs of vasopressin and adrenaline in action mm. practice most of us uh, do start vasopressin rather than adrenaline as a second line i agree with you uh, you, sir? sir good evening yeah please continue yes uh, uh, sir i am dr malikarjun sir malikarjun panchati Sir, uh, my question was: You said uh, we should go by the rotum or the tag for uh, uh, management of the DIC in conditions like uh, uh, PPH in uh, obstetric hemorrhage, where there is a very dynamic uh, process going on. The tag takes its own time, 
so in those conditions the we routinely follow like a 1 is to 1 ratio of uh, plasma platelets and the pcv such conditions is there any role of fibrinogen unless we get the value or should we start up using at the earlier point to no, avoid you could, uh, do it two ways one is uh, when you have massive uh, bleeding going on see what for example a trauma trauma major trauma i think what we should do is uh, you uh, the the crash trial has actually shown that start your uh, uh, tranexamic acid within 1 hour and you give your blood products 1 is to 1 is to 1 what mm-hmm. you can do as far as uh, rontem and tag is concerned is once these products are actually given yes sir then you do a tag in this uh, uh, rontem to find out what is again deficient and correct it that would be my answer to that question you follow the protocols the crash trial says that massive hemorrhage give your tranexamic acid within one hour loading dose and start an infusion give your one is to one is to one product that is uh, ffp platelets and cryo whatever it is and then once you finish all these products then you do a tag or rota the role comes in more important because you have given products then you see what is the deficient and then correct it accordingly Okay. i don't know whether there's difference of opinion from others also those who want to give a comment please do that uh so in spite of uh, giving so many times we have given adequate amount of uh, products blood products everything still it becomes almost like a uh, irreversible stage we, where we cannot uh, correct the hemorrhage any other things other than the products what you suggest to use sir particularly obstetric hemorrhage and thing no there may be a role for see we uh, new products that has actually come into the market includes the use of octaplex which is a pcc okay sir uh-huh. protein complex concentrate is very powerful it can stop bleeding you have factor 7 which can also stop bleeding so these are new products which can factor 7 you can use pardon me but only if it's a life threatening I yes, think you can yes, use Nova yes, Seven exactly. or maybe Factor Seven, but only if it's a life-threatening emergency, and uh, you can use it as a generalized hemostat. I mean, otherwise, it's not just routine uh, if you've not done it. Yeah, expensive, and you have to be careful when you use it. Yeah, because sir, obstetric hemorrhage is uh, our concern is only during that period, sir, and then. No, these products have got a side uh, side effect in the sense that, especially uh, the octaplex or the PCC complex, they can cause thrombotic complications also. so you have to be careful when you use it fine sir fine sir there are some instances where the patient even spot of giving adequate uh, fluid resuscitation vasopressors adequate antibiotics still that uh, blood pressure doesn't improve in spite of using the maximum dose what else or any other method which you suggest as